Sometimes long-term success comes down to being in the right place at the right time. For the Cincinnati Bengals, they certainly hope that's the case with number one overall pick Joe Burrow. It's a dream come true to finally be picked. We got us one. Burrow transformed himself as a projected late round pick coming into the 2019 season and responded by having what many are calling the single best season from a QB in college football history. The narrative around the Bengals is often much maligned. They've been to two Super Bowls, but those came back in the 80s and they lost both of those to the 49ers. They've been snake bitten in the playoffs, losing games by freak injuries and untimely penalties. Can Burrow change the culture of the entire franchise? Will he get the most of a young and talented supporting cast on offense? These questions will be answered in time, but one thing is crystal clear. The Ohio-born Burrow certainly doesn't lack the confidence to put the organization's hopes on his own shoulders. Well, if that doesn't have you fired up, I don't know what does. Welcome to Fantasy Football Today. I'm Jamie, that's Heath, that's Adam, that's Dave, and we're talking about the Bengals for a reason because their quarterback is locked in, and the quarterback that he's replacing in terms of Joe Burrow, Andy Dalton, now on the move. The Bengals have released Andy Dalton, and now he is free to find a new team. We're going to break down the quarterback situations for maybe Dalton, as well as look at what Burrow's fantasy outlook means for him, as well as the Bengals. Let's get right to it, guys. So Andy Dalton... We know there's two teams out there that could be looking at him. Our buddy Pete Prisco has said the Patriots and cover your ears, Heath, the Jaguars are the two teams that are probably going to be looking at Andy Dalton now that he's a free man. So let's start with the Patriots and just kind of speculate here. What could the fantasy outlook be for Dalton as well as the pass catchers and the running backs as well? So, Dave, I'll start with you. Andy Dalton, if he goes to the Patriots, any interest in two quarterback leagues, super flex formats, not just as a backup, but as a potential starter in those leagues? Wait a minute. Why not as a starter in a one quarterback league? I kid. I kid. Okay, if you want to go I that really far, go ahead. <laughs> I do not. No, thank you. I'll pass. I'd rather have Burrow. I'd rather have about 20 other quarterbacks. Thank you very much. Uh, I think he's a good number two quarterback if he lands in New England. Obviously, the weapons around him would be okay. That offensive line would be good. And I figured that the scheme would work for him. Andy Dalton really hasn't been a great fantasy quarterback since 2013, but I think he'd be okay as a number two guy, bi week quarterback in one quarterback leagues uh, if he goes to the Patriots. Adam, what would this mean for Julian Edelman, James White, Sony Michelle, the primary guys that we'd be looking at? If you want to throw Nikhil Harry in there also, Muhammad Sanu, but I mean, clearly Edelman is the one that we're going to have our eyes on. If Dalton goes to the Patriots, is Edelman back in the range of a starting fantasy receiver? Yeah, I think so. I think low end number two, high end number three. But you get a competent quarterback. Dalton himself really wasn't that bad his first eight games before he got benched. He scored 18 or more fantasy points and six point per passing touchdown leagues in six of those eight games. The two times he didn't at Pittsburgh and at Baltimore, not exactly easy matchups there. He threw a lot for sure, and he's not going to light it up, but he, he was good. You know, he was solid. He moved the ball. Uh, the Bengals really didn't have that bad of a passing offense. They were top 20. They weren't terrible last year. And the last time we saw Dalton with A.J. Green, he actually played pretty well. That was two years ago, the first half of the season. So we are not talking about a bad quarterback here. I think that he's going to uh, be a good find for whichever team gets him. I think he'd be an upgrade over Gardner, Minshew, and Jared Stidham. And yeah, he could help Julian Edelman. It's not going to be the connection he had with Tom Brady, but he could definitely make Edelman a guy that I'd be excited to draft maybe beginning in round six or so in a PPR league. All right, Heath, tell me about Nikhil Harry and Muhammad Sanu, the secondary options there, as well as the running backs. What would Andy Dalton do for them? Well, I think it'd be good for James White. We've seen Andy Dalton throw the ball to his running backs in the past. Giovanni Bernard's had some success with Dalton as his quarterback. I don't know what it would take to salvage value for Nikhil Harry. He couldn't hardly get on the field as a rookie and didn't look very good when he did. He was outplayed by Jacoby Myers. So I think it more comes down to, for Harry, is he going to live up to his potential as a football player? Does he get to play a high percentage of the snaps? And then if he does, we can start worrying about his quarterback play. Mohamed Sanu is someone that you might draft in a deep best ball league, but I'm not sure quarterback's going to change things for him. So if he goes to the Patriots in terms of Dalton, it's pretty easy to say he's going to be the starter. This one's going to be tough for you, Heath, because if he goes to Jacksonville, you've been an Andy Dalton guy in the past. You certainly are a Gardner Minshew guy now. What would that be for the quarterback situation? If he goes to Jacksonville, is he walking in as the starter, or do you think it's going to be a competition? 
I think we'd probably have to judge by his contract. I would assume it would be a competition. I don't quite know why everyone always says Jacksonville's the second best option. They're clearly not trying to compete this year. I don't know why they'd go spend money on a veteran and not find out if Gardner Minshew could be their quarterback of the future and play Andy Dalton and maybe win six games instead of four this year. It doesn't really make much sense to me. But if Andy Dalton was the starter in Jacksonville, I think he might actually have just a little bit more appeal than he does in New England because they are going to be a bad team. They are going to throw the ball more than 600 times this year, and he would have good weapons, probably even better weapons, at least in the passing game. Dave, would Andy Dalton to Jacksonville change anything in your mind for Leonard Fournette? Uh, We're assuming that Leonard Fournette's going to stay in Jacksonville as well. Uh, You know, I don't think it would necessarily change anything. For the record, I think the Jaguars shouldn't get Andy Dalton. I think that they can get by and have a sub-500 year with Gardner Minshew. And if Dalton is there, does it change anything for Fournette? No, he's still going to be someone that I'm going to be nervous about taking as a number two fantasy running back because I don't think the team is committed to him anymore. He's in the last year of his deal. There are rumors they were trying to trade him. He got a lot of touches last year, didn't score a lot of touchdowns with them. I would be nervous that Jacksonville would move on from Fournette at some point, relegate him to the bench, make the pick that I used to take him in my fantasy draft completely worthless. Well, we'll find out if that's the case. There could be some uh, roster construction coming from the backfield in Jacksonville, although the fact that they got through the NFL draft and didn't add significant competition probably tells you that Fournette will be their guy for the season. Adam, at the Pro Bowl, I spoke to DJ Chark. I asked him about playing with two quarterbacks last year with Nick Foles and with Gardner Minshew. He talked about the positives and the negatives for each guy. If it is Dalton coming in to compete with Minshew for the starting job, is there one quarterback you think that would help Chark? And obviously they drafted LaVisca Chenault as well, the guy that we're looking at as the second receiver there for the Jaguars. What would a quarterback change potentially do for him? I guess when you're looking at this situation, you just have to ask yourself, who's going to throw for more yards? And I think it would be Andy Dalton because Gardner Minshew has more scrambling ability. Andy Dalton has really not that much scrambling ability. So I, look, I don't know how good Gardner Minshew is. You want to judge him by his rookie year. The, the numbers don't jump off the page, but really, by most measures, he had a better rookie year as a passer than Kyler Murray did. So there's potential there based on what Gardner Minshew did. He doesn't really have a big pedigree. I have my doubts about him. They, they, they're they pretty quick to give up on him and go back to Nick Foles when Minshew struggled in that London game, and then Foles was just too bad, and they had to go back to Gardner Minshew. So I'm not sure how committed they are to him. And I also think you've got a coach on the hot seat here. So he's going to want the guy that can give them a respectable record. I think Dalton might be that guy. Might be better in terms of, you know, getting near 500 for the Bengals. And I think for Chark, I think for the wide receivers, Dalton would be better simply because I think he'd throw the ball more. He wouldn't resort to scrambling as much as Gardner Minshew would. I think if Heath could punch you right now, he actually might try and do so with all that negative Gardner Minshew talk. But I, I am glad that you referenced the coach on the hot seat, the general manager is on the hot seat as well. And so... They, while the, the, the plan may seemingly seem like they're going to tank, those two gentlemen in particular probably want to accrue some wins. So we'll see if they do decide to get Andy Dalton, Cam Newton, also a potential out there for the Jaguars if, in fact, Dalton goes to the Patriots. But we'll find out where Andy Dalton lands, and I'm sure we'll break it down here on Fantasy Football today. We do know that Joe Burrow is going to be the guy for the Bengals, as the show told you at the top. And I think it's going to be a great situation for him. I don't know if anybody's drafting him as a number one fantasy quarterback, but he's certainly going to be in the conversation of the high end number two guys. Keith, I think you're probably the low guy on Joe Burrow. What's the concern for him going as the number one overall pick to becoming a good to potentially startable fantasy quarterback? Well, there have only been a handful of quarterbacks in the last 20 years that have finished as top 12 quarterbacks in terms of fantasy production. And most of those guys, if not all of those guys, have done so on the strength of their legs and not their arms. Generally, you need 250, 300, five five rushing touchdowns. And we saw it with Kyler Murray. We saw it with Lamar Jackson when he was actually good. When Josh Allen was productive as a rookie, it was with his legs. Joe Burrow has some athleticism. I, I'm not saying I don't think that he could run around a little bit. I don't think he's going to run as much as he those guys did. I think he's going to have to do most of it with his arm. And especially in this offseason, with an abbreviated offseason, he's not going to get as much work in the system with his receivers as a typical rookie quarterback would. I think the expectation should be, if you're doing a 16-game pro- projection, those first three or four games are probably going to be bad. Then he might be average by midseason, and it's very possible that in the second half of the season, Joe Burrow is a top 12 quarterback. I don't think he finishes there. I think you fit, you project him as a, a low-end or mid-range number two quarterback and hope that in the second half, he gives you some games that you really feel good about. 
as we saw last year, Kyler Murray was not a consistent fantasy starter. Daniel Jones had some good games. Gardner Minshew had some good games, but also some bad games, as Adam referenced, that one in London in particular. He may have been the start of the week that week. I don't know, but we'll uh, we'll sort of throw that one out. In any event, uh, you look at the Bengals receiving core here and, and, and the personnel. Dave, uh, I know you're excited about Joe Burrow. How excited are you about A.J. Green, Tyler Boyd, T. Higgins, and John Ross? I may be unnecessarily uh, optimistic about this entire rookie draft class, and certainly for Burrow, when I watched him play, I thought he was fantastic. And I expect him to come into the league, assuming there's a training camp and all that good stuff. I think he can play right away and be pretty effective right away. I think he throws a more accurate football than Andy Dalton, and I think he can stand in the pocket and deliver strikes when there's pressure all around him, just like Andy Dalton couldn't do when he was in Cincinnati. So I'm optimistic that A.J. Green can catch a lot of footballs. Tyler Boyd can catch a lot of footballs. This passing offense will be pretty good. I would look at A.J. Green and say right around 50th overall is the time to take a chance on him. I know that he let us down last year. He didn't play. But we know that when he's healthy, he's a good talent. And if he's got a great quarterback, he's got a shot to finish as a top 12 fantasy wide receiver. All right, so Heath a little bit more pessimistic on the Bengals. Dave a little bit more optimistic. Adam, break the tie. Where do you come out? Is this going to be a great season for the passing game in Cincinnati or maybe just a growing pain type of year as uh, Joe Burrow sort of learns the ropes of the NFL a little bit? I think it's going to be more of a growing pain type of year. I'm not super optimistic. One thing that rookie quarterbacks don't typically do is throw a lot of touchdown passes. Baker Mayfield has the record. I think it was 27 so, you know, and most rookie quarterbacks don't start from week one, and Burrow will. So he has a chance to break the record. Even Baker Mayfield didn't start from week one. But you look at Andrew Luck, his first season, 23 touchdowns, 18 interceptions. And I think that's where you might see the struggles. You might see a lot of turnovers from Joe Burrow. And Heath mentioned his rushing totals. He rushed for almost 400 yards as a junior, I think 368 yards last year, in less than 16 games. He, he can run. So that's also going to hurt the passing game a little bit because he might have the tendency to scramble, like what I said about Gardner Minshew. So you know, I, I have some, some expectations in terms of yards for A.J. Green. I think he'll get over 1,000 yards. I'm hoping for more like 1,100 yards. Uh, but I think the touchdowns are going to be low for these guys. I think that's where they might hurt you in fantasy if you draft them too early. I'm also concerned, are we going to get a holdout from A.J. Green? What's T. Higgins' role going to be? How much is that going to hurt both Green and Tyler Boyd? I'm also taking a little bit more of a pessimistic approach with those guys, but I do think that if you are looking for a number two fantasy quarterback with upside, Joe Burrow is almost at the top of the list because if he does hit and does perform, maybe like Dave is expecting, then you could be in the situation where you have two good quarterbacks on your roster or maybe the best one ends up being Burrow. But we'll find out how this all works once we get to training camp and then certainly early in the season. All right, when we come back, we're going to take a look at some running back situations, some running back battles. Following the NFL draft, there were a lot of great rookies that join the NFL and they're going to make some veterans uncomfortable. We'll break down some of these backfields for the Colts, for the Chiefs and others coming up next here on Fantasy Football Today. Welcome back to Fantasy Football Today. We're taking a look at some backfield battles that have been impacted by the NFL draft. So rookies joining some potentially now crowded backfields where the veterans could be put on notice or maybe the rookie's just going to step in and take the job right away. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to present the guys, the running backs that we're talking about. They're going to give me the best case scenario and the worst case scenario for the newcomer and maybe what could be the bad situation for the guy that's already there. So let's start with the Chiefs. We know they were the first team to draft a running back in the NFL draft, taking Clyde Edwards-Hilaire with the 32nd overall pick, the running back from LSU. So Keith, give me the best case scenario for Edwards-Hilaire's fantasy value in 2020 he wins the job in camp starts week one and finished second at running back behind christian mccaffrey is that uh succinct enough i mean really he's in the best offense in football he fits everything they want to do and patrick mahomes wanted to draft him so the sky is the absolute limit the worst case scenario is that damian williams is the early downs back for the first half of the year clyde edwards hilaire is just a low-end number two running back you're just supposed to give me the best case scenario we're going to save debbie downer for uh, your buddy there adam azer so the uh, best case scenario is number two. He can't be number one. I mean, come on. If you're going to shoot for the moon, shoot for the moon. Um, all right, Adam. So give me the worst case scenario for uh, for the rookie in Kansas City. Uh, can I just say ditto? Because Heath just stole my answer. <laughs> the worst case scenario is they say, hey, Damian Williams did really well for us down the stretch in 2018. He should have been the Super Bowl MVP in 2019. He's still a good running back. And look at the way we used our running backs last year. 
It was a, a total split whether Damian Williams was in the lineup or not. They used Daryl Williams with LaShawn McCoy. So the worst case scenario is that like many rookie running backs, Clyde Edwards Elair doesn't get a lot of work and he's a very solid flex specifically in PPR, but he doesn't really help you much in non-PPR. I, I lean toward the best case scenario though. I, I think the more I, the more I think about it, the higher I'm getting on Clyde Edwards Elair. Best case scenario, number two in fantasy. Worst case scenario, a flex. So there you have sort of the spectrum of where maybe he falls if things go well or things go poorly. Let's go now to Detroit, where we have DeAndre Swift joining the Lions backfield with on Johnson. Seems as if those two guys are going to be the only ones we talk about. At least that's what we hope. So Dave, give me the best case scenario for Swift now that he's in Detroit. It's going to be similar to what we said about Edwards Elaire. He eliminates the competition, whether because on gets hurt again or because on just stinks. And his aggressive zone scheme running wins him the three down job in Detroit. And the Lions coaching staff says, we found our next Barry Sanders. Now that's lofty. It's tough to expect that to be the case, but that is the best case scenario where he runs away with over 1400 total yards and double digit touchdowns in his rookie year in Detroit. It would be the first time in seven seasons, the Lions would have a running back with over a thousand yards. All right, so best case scenario, Pretty lofty totals and pretty lofty comparison with uh, Barry Sanders. Heath, you're Debbie Downer on this one. Give me the worst case scenario for the rookie Detroit. Carry on Johnson doesn't stink. And what if he doesn't get hurt? What if he plays 16 games? I don't think DeAndre Swift's going to play very much on third down. And he might split the early down work as well. He could be a low end flex. His worst case scenario, worse than Clyde Edwards Elair because limited touches on the Lions is terrible. They haven't had a good running back since I can't remember when. Yeah, it seems like it's been a while. Uh, I think, you know, this is going to be a fun one to keep an eye on because Carry On still has two more years left on his contract. Will they play it out with both these guys sharing touches or will Swift prove to be the better talent and play over Carry On Johnson? A lot of people sort of split on how these guys are going to go. I think we're all going to take Swift ahead of Carry On, but maybe not a bad investment to take Carry On Johnson with a later round pick, probably around round eight or so as we've seen. Let's go now to Indianapolis where the Colts have drafted Jonathan Taylor running back from Wisconsin. Adam, first word to you. Give me the optimal side of things for Taylor this year. Best case scenario, he averages 5.2 yards per carry running behind one of the best offensive lines. That's better than what Marlon Mack has done. He scores eight or nine touchdowns, just like Marlon Mack has done two straight years. The Colts realize by week four, hey, if we're going anywhere, we're, go we're getting there uh, behind Jonathan Taylor. He's just much better than Marlon Mack, and he ends up being a must-start option. I think 25 catches, though, is the catch upside. I don't see a lot of potential there because of Naheem Hines. Uh, but he could be one of the most efficient running backs. And if he's the goal line back, you were talking about really a, a stud that would be worth drafting in about round four if he gets that early work, uh, if he gets that work early. All right, Dave. So uh, Adam mentioned it. Naheem Hines, Marlon Mack. It could be the more crowded situation of the teams that we talked about, even including Kansas City with all the running backs that they have. Give me the negative for Taylor this year. It is decidedly the most crowded backfield situation, and I don't think Naheem Hines is going to lose his job no matter how good Jonathan Taylor plays. So you can forget about third downs and a lot of catches for Taylor. But this kid had 18 fumbles in 41 games. Let's say it's week one. He's at the goal line. He goes for the pylon. He fumbles the football. It goes the other way for a touchdown. Now he's splitting the rushing carries with Marlon Mack, and that means he's only getting, what, 30% of the work? He's not going to be able to break out and be a great fantasy asset if he does that. That's the worst case scenario. He's splitting half the work with Marlon Mack all season long. Yeah, it could be a lot of mouths to feed there. It would be nice maybe if the Colts did us a favor and traded Marlon Mack, giving Jonathan Taylor the clear path to that featured workload. So round four is where Adam says is the best case scenario to draft him. Dave, obviously looking at it from the perspective of if everybody's getting work and maybe the fumbles become a problem, Jonathan Taylor may be sitting on your bench if you do invest in him too early. Let's go now to the Rams where they drafted Cam Akers. We know Todd Gurley no longer in Los Angeles. He's in Atlanta. Not a crowded backfield for the Falcons, but for the Rams, you have Daryl Henderson and Malcolm Brown, at least for now. So Heath, give me the best case scenario for Akers in Los Angeles. This requires a lot of imagination, but if he could go into camp and immediately beat out Daryl Henderson and do something last year that Henderson couldn't do and beat out Malcolm Brown and actually get a feature role in the Rams offense, and then if Sean McVay turns back the clock, not to the offense they ran last year when they were targeting tight ends so heavenly, but back to 2017, 2018, they threw to running backs a lot. 
you could see Cam Akers possibly finish as high as a high-end number two running back in this offense. I still don't think the offensive line is very good. I'm not sure he has top 12 upside, but he could be top 15. So Dave, he's kind of laid it out for you there. Daryl Henderson, Malcolm Brown, that can make things tough for Cam Akers. Give me the negative side for him this year. What if the drafting of Cam Akers lit a fire under Daryl Henderson a year ago this time? And I'm guilty of this, too. We were we were very excited about Henderson and his potential working alongside Todd Gurley. And if Todd Gurley were to get hurt, then Henderson would be the one leading the way for this Rams offense. This is a team that does like to run the football. Before last season, they were top 10 in rush attempts and rushing offense. They were doing great with Gurley. And maybe Henderson says, you know what? I'm better than this. I had a good pedigree coming out of Memphis. And he grabs the brass ring. He keeps Cam Akers limited. He dominates passing downs. Malcolm Brown has goal line work. Cam Akers only gets maybe 10 touches per game. This next running back situation we look at could be a little bit more tricky because the Ravens spent a second round pick on J.K. Dobbins, but they clearly are entrenched with Mark Ingram as their guy, at least for now. So, Adam, make the case why maybe Dobbins can be better than Ingram and maybe better than all these guys if things work out really well for him. I don't think he's going to be better than Mark Ingram, but Jamie, I respect you as the host of this show, so I will make the case. He's younger. He's younger. He, I don't know. I just, Mark Ingram was really good. Look, so this is going to be a tough guy to replace, but J.K. Dobbins, I like him a lot. He is a tough physical runner who faced some of the best run defenses in college football in each of his last four or five games. And every single one of those games, he had huge games. He rushed for like 150 or more yards every single time. We know Mark Ingram's had injury history in the past. We know he doesn't really do much in the passing game. Maybe J.K. Dobbins is a more well-rounded player. And Gus Edwards got 133 carries. So we're going to know about J.K. Dobbins. We're going to know how good he is. And the Ravens might just say, hey, Mark Ingram's good, but J.K. Dobbins is great. By the second half of the season, maybe they turn it loose and let the young guy lead the way. Maybe he gets all those touchdowns this year. I'd like to say that I respect you as the host of our Fantasy Football Today podcast, but we all know that's (laughs) not the case. Uh, The one thing, I mean, look, it could be a scenario like we saw at the end of last season where Ingram pops his calf and and Dobbins gets an opportunity maybe sooner in the season and gets a chance to run behind that offensive line with a great rushing quarterback, which would open up some rushing lanes. So injury could be the biggest thing for Dobbins, but I think we're all in agreement that Ingram, if he's healthy, will be the lead back there in Baltimore. So when we look at the negative side of things here, Heath, give me the worst case scenario for Dobbins. Does he even play? See, Justice Hill, 2019. Like, I, I don't think that's likely. Dobbins is a much better prospect than Hill. I He was my second favorite running back in this class. I liked him more than Swift. So I really think that this is unlikely, but there is a chance. This is a Baltimore Ravens team that has su- Super Bowl aspirations. They're not putting a rookie on the field unless they are 100% sure that he makes them better. And they were the best running team in the NFL last year. So I think there's a chance that this is almost like a red sh- shirt year for Dobbins. And I think you kind of said it. He was your second favorite prospect coming into this. His dynasty value much better than his seasonal value when you're looking at rookie-only drafts versus seasonal drafts. Rookie-only drafts, you can make a case that he could be number two or number three behind Clyde Edwards-Hilaire. So you'll see him go higher in rookie-only drafts than maybe you might expect. But that's because 2021, we could see him as the starter in Baltimore. The starter for Tampa Bay in 2020, however, is going to be a fun one to watch that running back battle because we saw last year Ronald Jones struggle and Keyshawn Vaughn now part of the roster. So when we look at this backfield, Dave, give me the best case scenario for Vaughn this season. The best case scenario is that Ronald Jones makes mistakes in training camp. Bruce Arian says he's had enough and he uh, he calls on Keyshawn Vaughn to be the primary running back for the Tampa Bay Buccaneers. We already know that Vaughn is the better pass protector. So that's a role he should have right away. He's probably going to have to prove that he's the better pass catcher, but I think he can beat Jones in that regard. And then he's going to have to prove that he's the better running back for Tampa Bay over Jones. And I'm not sure he can do that quite quickly to begin the season. By the midpoint, it might happen. But the best case scenario would be Ronald Jones just messes up. Keyshawn Vaughn gets the opportunity. Keyshawn Vaughn has 1,300 yards and double-digit touchdowns. Adam, I believe you said either on one of our programs here on HQ on the on the podcast that you would still take Ronald Jones over Keyshawn Vaughn, so this should be easy for you. Make the uh, worst-case scenario for Vaughn this year. Keyshawn Vaughn is older than Ronald Jones. Fifth-year senior, not exactly a highly touted prospect. Yeah, look, he's going to probably play on third down ahead of Ronald Jones, unless Daria Gumbawale plays on third down. Daria had 35 catches. 
I think the worst case scenario is almost no role at all for Keyshawn Vaughn. Because Dave's right, he has to prove that he's a better rusher than Ronald Jones, and he might be. Ronald Jones has been nothing special, that's for sure. But if he doesn't do that, I'm not convinced that he's going to be their third down guy. Maybe he's better in pass protection than Jones. Doesn't mean he's going to be better than Agumba Wale. Pass protection can be something that's difficult for rookie running backs. So I can see like Daryl Henderson had pretty much no role last year. I can see Keyshawn Vaughn being completely irrelevant. I think there is a very, very low floor for him. Did see a report from Greg Allman in The Athletic who covers the Bucks, saying that for right now, going into the season, Jones still the starter. Vaughn is going to step into Peyton Barber's vacated role and that Dario Gumbawale, for now, the third down back. So if that holds, then Vaughn could be in trouble. But if Vaughn does prove to be better in certain situations, most likely on passing situations than Ronald Jones, then he will probably elevate himself to a certainly higher degree, maybe even than Jones. That's what you're looking for if you're banking on Vaughn. Let's go now to the Packers and their situation. Another one that kind of threw us for a loop. We know that Green Bay passed on taking anything other than a quarterback in round one, and then they took a third string running back, at least on paper, in round two in A.J. Dillon. So, Keith, make the case for Dillon going to the backfield right now that features Aaron Jones as well as Jamal Williams. I think it starts with him getting red zone work, and it's hard to imagine when Aaron Jones was so good in that role, but this could be a situation where they split the early downs work, maybe 60-40 in Aaron Jones' favor. Jones gets most of the third down work, but Dylan takes most of the short yardage work. And if that happens, you could see Dylan score seven, eight, nine touchdowns, even with Aaron Jones getting more touches than him, and he'd be a decent flex. All right, Dave, give me the worst case scenario for Dylan, who joined us before the NFL draft on fantasy football today. So we don't want to speak too poorly of him, but what could be the worst case scenario for him this year? That Matt LaFleur, it comes true to his word that he wants to use three running backs all the time in his offense, which means Jamal Williams really doesn't lose that much of his role. Jones loses a considerable part and Dylan doesn't get a big enough part. And it's a three headed monster where you're basically playing roulette with your fantasy running backs, starting one of those guys. But there's another layer to it. Aaron Rodgers says, you know what, Matt LaFleur, you're on the sideline, I'm on the field, I can change the plays, you call the run, forget it, I'm throwing, and Aaron Rodgers goes full YOLO on Matt LaFleur this year and starts <laughs> throwing more, which means the Packers are running less, which means there's even fewer carries to split three ways, and it becomes an awful headache, and the Packers go seven and nine. It feels like that could be something that we're headed for. We're going to find out, I think, once we get to week one, who's running the show here. Is it Aaron Rodgers or is it Matt LaFleur, or... Or are they both just on the same page trying to get back to the NFC Championship game and maybe make it to the Super Bowl this season? We'll find out when we get to the season with Green Bay. One more rookie backfield battle that we're looking at here. It's in Buffalo, Devin Singletary, getting some company with Zach Moss. And so when we talk about this situation, Adam, give me the best case scenario for Moss. This is a baffling one, Jamie, honestly. I, the best case scenario is that he just is better than Devin Singletary and, and takes over for Devin Singletary and maybe he gets more work in the passing game. The best case scenario, I guess, would be that they use him the way they use Frank Gore, who dominated carries inside the five yard line. Devin Singletary only had two of those. Frank Gore had somewhere around 10 last year. So uh, this could be the, the touchdown poacher. And really, his best case scenario is, is just ruining Devin Singletary's value. I, I don't really like this backfield much for fantasy purposes, because I don't think either is going to have a lot of work in the passing game, and I think they're going to split carries. But best case scenario is he leads the team in rushing touchdowns. It kind of buries Devin Singletary. All right, Heath, give me the worst case scenario for Zach Moss and maybe the best case scenario for Singletary. Yeah, I don't necessarily agree with Adam's best case scenario for Zach Moss. I think he could just take the job from Singletary. But Singletary dominates touches the way that people were hoping that he would. Zach Moss gets a very limited role and struggles in the red zone, maybe fumbles at the goal line and just disappears and is never heard from again. <laughs> well, uh, maybe, maybe that's the case. Uh, Jimmy Hoffa style. We never hear from him again. What do you know? Uh, gentlemen, well done. Break it down. Eight backfield. You just made our producer, Andrew Balmer, very happy with how well you did that. And so now we got plenty of time to talk about some more backfield battles which we're going to do coming up next here on Fantasy Football Today. And one that could be certainly interesting, San Francisco alleviated themselves of one of their bodies with Matt Breida on the move to Miami. But still, we have Tevin Coleman, Dean Mostert. We'll tell you about the San Francisco backfield next here on Fantasy Football Today. Welcome back to Fantasy Football Today. We're taking a look at some questionable backfields following the NFL Draft, following some moves this offseason. We told you about the rookies and how they impacted some backfields in our previous segment. 
Now let's look a little bit more at some of the veterans that could be competing with each other for starting jobs in San Francisco. While they did trade Matt Breida during the NFL draft, sending him to Miami for a fifth round pick, Jarek McKinnon expected to return if he's healthy with that knee injury. They also have Jeff Wilson, who played a little bit for them last year, but we know it's Tevin Coleman, Raheem Mostert. So, Dave, when you look at this backfield, is it just Raheem Mostert's job and then Tevin Coleman's going to be the number two guy fantasy-wise? Or is it going to be a little bit more of a split between these two from a fantasy production standpoint? It might be a split, including Jarek McKinnon as well. He's still on the team. I know that they like Jeff Wilson. He's a more physical running back. He could get involved. Kyle Shanahan does not care about our fantasy football teams. But you, you, you can't ignore what Raheem Moser did last year, right? He was pretty on fire all the way through toward the end of the season. Tevin Coleman only had eight games with 10 or more carries, including the playoffs, but only one from December through January. So I'm, I'm, I'm wondering if he's the one whose role gets minimized the most. I think Mostert is the one whose role gets maximized the most, but I don't know if that necessarily means he's gonna be good for 15 touches a week. I think this backfield will continue to be a headache. Mostert gets the most touches the most. I love that alliteration. Uh, Keith, we did a uh, PPR mock draft recently, and you said when Tevin Coleman kept falling and falling and falling, finally he took him, he said, God, you guys all must hate Tevin Coleman. Make the case for Coleman. He was the starter despite most are being better, but he's still the guy that Kyle Shanahan seems to favor on those first and second uh, series that they play. Yeah, the starter for most of last year, and I believe the starter in the Super Bowl, despite what Mostert had done in the second half. Now, Mostert did get some carries late in that game, but it, it, through the first 20 minutes of the game, we hadn't seen Raheem Mostert touch the football. So I don't really think that I can predict what Kyle Shanahan's going to do with these two running backs. I've got them almost at a 50-50 split of the touches that aren't wasted on Jarek McKinnon. But I do think they might waste 100 touches on Jarek McKinnon because that's just kind of what they do. And I say waste, for a fantasy perspective at least. I think you look at both Mostert and Tevin Coleman as number three running backs, not bad zero RB options. The nice thing is with Tevin Coleman, you can get him in the ninth or tenth round, at least in our drafts. And I absolutely love that value as a third or fourth running back. Adam has a bold prediction coming up about Raheem Mostert uh, in our final segment, so stay tuned for his take on the 49ers. The Dolphins' backfield again, totally different. They added two running backs this offseason. They trade for Matt Breida during the NFL draft, and they signed Jordan Howard. So, Adam, give me the breakdown here. Is Breida the best one? Is Howard the best one? Or is it really just a matter of format for these two guys? I think it's this. I think Jordan Howard is more likely to score more fantasy points than Matt Breida. But if you want to take an upside play, it's Matt Breida. In terms of explosive plays, carries of more than 20 yards, Jordan Howard's one of the worst in the NFL. Not cumulatively, he, he's had some, but per carry, he's terrible. He just doesn't make big plays. He also doesn't catch any passes, and you would think Breida would assume that role. Breida's not a guy who's had, you know, seven or eight carries. They put him out there for double-digit carry games quite a bit, and he's been pretty good in San Francisco. This won't be as easy of a situation. The offensive line, I don't think, is going to be very good. I don't think the Dolphins are going to be very good. I think people are probably a little bit too high on them just because they went to Foxborough and won in Week 17. Uh, they could be terrible again, but I think that Jordan Howard with the Dolphins, this is his third team in four years. He's not that good. The Dolphins are going to realize that they're better off giving more carries to Matt Breida. I know he's had trouble staying healthy. But if he does stay healthy, Brita has the potential to really change your fantasy team. Jordan Howard has the potential to be a good bye week replacement. All right, Dave, make the case for Howard. He's just as old as Ezekiel Elliott, or probably just as young as Ezekiel Elliott, depending if you want to take the positive side of things. Uh, he's had some productive years in the NFL. Can he be the better running back in Miami? Well, we know that Breed has been banged up quite a bit over his career. It hasn't necessarily cost him a lot of playing time. He's played through a lot of ankle injuries, but... If he does get beat up, then Jordan Howard is going to see all the work in this Dolphins offense, and he's capable of catching the football. He just hasn't been asked to do a lot of it. And I do think the Dolphins offensive line will be significantly better than where it was last year. It has to be with all the additions they made in free agency in the draft. And Howard could hammer home six or seven touchdowns. I would still draft Breida ahead of Howard. I just think the upside play it makes him worth it. But Howard is still one of those running backs that I wouldn't mind putting in my lineup weeks one, two, and three if I go zero RB, if I decide to build my roster with a lot of receivers and tight ends, go and get a running back later on. Howard's one I'm targeting. I just made a very disgusting trade in a dynasty league where I had <laughs> OJ Howard as my only tight end 
and I traded Jordan Howard, who would have been my fifth running back in PPR, for Jack Doyle. I feel icky saying it, but I had to make a move. That was the only tight end I can get, and somebody was willing to take on Jordan Howard. So sometimes you got to do things to make your fans team better. Hopefully Jack Doyle is better than Jordan Howard, and we'll see if Jordan Howard is better than Matt Breida this year. Let's go now to the Washington backfield, where they just got so many guys that they just keep adding to, adding Antonio Gibson in the NFL draft. They signed Peyton Barber this offseason. Hopefully Darius Geis is going to be healthy. Adrian Peterson is still there. I think John Riggins is coming back. They just have everybody in Washington ready to carry the ball. So, Keith, is this the year for Darius Geis? Every time I look at our rankings, it seems like you're the high guy on Geis. Can this be the season for him to finally break through and stay on the field? Yeah, I'll be the optimist and say let's, he just stays healthy all through camp. They've got too many running backs in the roster. They decided to cut bait with Adrian Peterson, and he's not there to bother him anymore. Darius Geis gets 240 carries, maybe catches 20 passes, finishes a low-end number two running back. I still believe that he's very talented. And in that situation, I think Antonio Gibson could still be interesting if he finds himself in that Chris Thompson role. Different offense, but they're still going to throw to their running backs a lot. Dave, once upon a podcast, you said that this is still going to be a, a year where Adrian Peterson at 35 years old is a factor. That was before the NFL draft. Is Peterson still somebody that you're somewhat high on? No, not at all. Uh, we do expect guys to be ready for the start of the season. And the running back in Washington that I'm actually high on is Gibson because I, I look at Ron Rivera, who came from Carolina, and Scott Turner, the offensive coordinator, who came from Carolina. And they were spoiled by having a running back who was great catching passes out of the backfield and surprising defenses with his speed and agility between the tackles. And I wonder if Gibson could be asked to do some of the things that Christian McCaffrey did. Love the idea of getting him with a double-digit round pick. I think he'll be worth it in PPR especially because, like he said, he could have that Chris Thompson role that's five catches per game, but he could expand on that because Geis gets hurt, Peterson's old, Peyton Barber's just a guy. Gibson could be the best running back in Washington by the end of the season. Yeah, we'll find out if uh, everybody gets hurt again. They still have Bryce Love trying to come back from injury. And in terms of the passing downs role, it could be J.D. McKissick, another guy that they signed, although he could also play on special teams. Gibson probably going to handle that role if things go well for him. Last backfield that we're going to talk about here is the one in Cleveland. And Adam, is this even worth discussing? Because Nick Chubb was so good last year, but he did struggle a little bit once Kareem Hunt came back from his suspension. I think a lot of people looking at his Chubb is just going to be an absolute superstar. But once we saw Hunt on the field, their PPR production wasn't that different. 12.3 for Chubb, 11.8 for Hunt once Hunt was on the field. Could this be a little bit trickier than people expect? So I think the main reason why Nick Chubb struggled in those last eight games was touchdowns. He still had 144 carries. He had 154 carries in his first eight games before Kareem Hunt came back. But... He, uh, he, didn't only, he only scored two touchdowns, only two rushing touchdowns and none uh, receiving. So I think that was the, the biggest problem there. He's still the second most carries in the NFL behind Joe Mixon in those eight games with Kareem Hunt. Therefore, I think what you're looking at is a guy who's not going to catch a lot of passes. I think he only caught 11 in the eight games with Nick Chubb, uh, with uh, Kareem Hunt rather. But you are going to get a guy who gets a lot of carries and probably the goal line work, just unlucky with the touchdowns. So I, yeah, it's, it's a pretty, I think, well-defined backfield unless Nick Chubb struggles. I don't think he will. I think he's awesome. I think he's going to get a lot of rushing yards, a lot of carries, hopefully a lot of rushing touchdowns. That's really the key number there is the rushing touchdowns. It was it was low, and that's why the PPR points were similar. Keith, at the Pro Bowl, before you know they were committed to uh, Kareem Hunt coming back, I asked Nick Chubb, do you want to have him back You know, sharing the, the workload with you? And he said, absolutely, it makes my job easier. That makes our job more frustrating. Could Kareem Hunt maybe be better value than Nick Chubb, who some people think should be a potential first-round pick in fantasy, probably more non-PPR than PPR. But is it almost better if you want to piece this backfield, just wait for Kareem Hunt with a pick after round five? I have certainly drafted a lot more Kareem Hunt than Nick Chubb, especially on my zero RB teams. I do think when you talked about it, the net points he scored, 11 PPR fantasy points per game, he does that all year long. He's going to be a number two running back. I think he has a chance to catch 70 passes and be the guy that maybe only gets, what, seven, eight, nine carries per game, but still is productive enough that you don't mind starting him as a flex and he's okay during bye weeks as a number two running back. Sounds like somebody you're very fond of, uh, at least what his part-time role was in Los Angeles with Austin Eckler, who was a very good pass catcher out of the backfield, didn't need a lot of touches, 
and was very successful. So we'll see how this backfield shakes out during the season. New coach and Kevin Stefanski, who had a very run-centric offense in Minnesota, could benefit both of those guys. That would be the most ideal situation. But Nick Chubb, we'll see if his first half production can also be his second half production, or maybe Kareem Hunt just going to ruin him. Speaking of Austin Eckler, I was going to tell you, we're going to tell you about some bold predictions coming up next here on Fantasy Football Today. Heath still very, very high on one of the top running backs from last year. Todd Gurley will tell you about his set situation and a little bit more on DeAndre Swift coming up next here on Fantasy Football Today. Welcome back to Fantasy Football Today. We're going to talk some bold predictions here for the running backs in 2020. So guys, be bold. Give me something that's going to knock me out of my chair. Dave, go first. Give me a bold prediction. Well, how about DeAndre Swift getting 1,200 total yards and seven touchdowns? And I know you're going to say that's not bold. It's been almost a decade since the Lions running back even came close to those kinds of numbers. And it's been almost a decade since the Lions have had a running back as talented as DeAndre Swift. I think he will take carry on Johnson, put him in a nice minimal role all season long. And you're going to see Swift have 1,850 total yards and 27 touchdowns. All right, that's bold, but that's kind of like Detroit bold. I need a little bit bigger bold. Come on, Adam, give me something bigger. Bigger than that. All right, Darius Geis is going to rush for 2,563 yards. He's only going to score 31 touchdowns rushing, but another eight receiving touchdowns for Darius Geis on only eight catches. That's really the incredible part. That's the bold part of the prediction. Darius Geis is going to be a league winner. That's the bold prediction for you. They have a crowded backfield, but it's basically a lot of mediocre guys. And we'll see what they have in Bryce Love. Uh, but I think Darius Geis has the pedigree and has the skill. We haven't seen much, but what we've seen has been pretty good. So the league winner would be second half of the season. He's healthy, takes over the job. He's 15 carries a game. He's a couple catches a game. He's scoring touchdowns on an improved Washington team. And you're going to be very happy you drafted Darius Geis. All right. So far, I'm ranking the bold predictions. Dave one, Adam two. Let's go, Heath. Top them both. Austin Eckler had his breakout year last year. They sent Melvin Gordon away. They paid Austin Eckler. Everybody now is giving me a hard time for drafting Austin Eckler in the first round. I'm doing that because he's going to be better than he was last year. More carries, similar number of catches, more total yards, more total touchdowns. He will be the number two running back in fantasy behind only Christian McCaffrey. That's bold. That's pretty good. Austin Eckler, the number two running back behind Christian McCaffrey. Wow. I, I, you, you said something earlier, though, in the show about another running back who could be number two in fantasy. I'm not going to go that high with Clyde Edwards Hilaire, but I think he's going to be top five. I love the outlook for him, the setup for him going to Kansas City. Forget about Damian Williams. Andy Reid's been trying to replace him for two years, bringing in LaShawn McCoy last year to have to share touches with him. He has his guy now. He has his next Westbrook. He has his next Kareem Hunt. He has his next superstar running back. Mahomes wanted him. Reed wants him. You want him. Clyde Edwards Hilaire will be a top five running back in PPR. There's some bold predictions for you. Swift, Geis, Eckler, and Clyde Edwards Hilaire. You're going to love those four running backs in the 2020 season. Let's move on now to our next topic here. Running back outside of your top 25, who you are looking to target the most. The guy that has you the most excited, but you just may not have him ranked inside your top 25. Dave, you go first. I already mentioned Antonio Gibson on the show today. I think that he's the one that I'm going to try and snag with a late pick in every PPR draft I'm in. I'm thinking round 11 or later, just someone who's got the coaching staff that might be thinking about Christian McCaffrey, someone who's got a skill set that's kind of like Christian McCaffrey's. I could see Antonio Gibson being the best running back in D.C. by the end of the season in PPR. We spent a lot of time talking about Christian McCaffrey. He must be pretty good. Uh, Adam, I teased this earlier. You're going to give us a statement about Raheem Mostert that's going to knock us off our, out of our uh, knock us down. <laughs> give me a Raheem Mostert. <laughs> knock your socks off, Jamie. And hey, he's going to catch for more passes than Christian McCaffrey. Now he's not. This has nothing to do with Christian McCaffrey. Yeah, he's the guy that I want outside the top 24, or top 25. Uh, Mostert, you know I love yards per carry, man. He's a stud. And he had a career 6.0 yards per carry, but not just that, very consistent. Okay, he's had he had 10 games last year with double-digit carries. He averaged 4.8 yards per carry in nine of those 10 games. So it's not like he breaks off one long run and then the next game he disappears. Very good every single time they used him. And as we were watching him last year, it was like, man, 
Raheem Mostert's pretty good. Maybe they should give him more run. They finally did. I don't care who started in the Super Bowl, who had more carries in the Super Bowl. And what happened when Tevin Coleman got hurt in the NFC Championship game against Green Bay? He ran for more than 200 yards and four touchdowns, Raheem Mostert. So this guy's awesome. I think he's got a lot more upside than Tevin Coleman. And I want to target him because I think if he gets 14 carries a game, he could be really good and he could score more touchdowns. I think he could have a high touchdown rate just based on the way the 49ers run their offense. Adam, yes or no, if you draft Raheem Mostert, you have to take Tevin Coleman as well. You should take Tevin Coleman two rounds later. You don't have to, though. Okay. Didn't say yes or no. Thank you. David Montgomery Sorry. is your guy, Heath, outside your top 25. Tell us why. Yeah, we're getting really excited about these rookie running backs. David Montgomery might be the cautionary tale, but I do think that he is probably right now in a better position than most of them. I expect he's going to have 245, 250 carries this year. He'll catch another 25 to 30 passes. I don't expect they'll be quite as bad at running the football as they were. I don't think Mitchell Trubisky or if Nick Foles wins the job will be as bad as he was at quarterback last year. I think there's a chance to buy low on Montgomery and Dynasty and draft him as a number three running back with upside this year. For me, I'm going to go with Keyshawn Vaughn. I will go against the cautionary tale and just take a chance on the guy being the best running back in Tampa Bay with that offense. So outside my top 25, when I'm looking around six or later, I'm going to take a shot on Keyshawn Vaughn. All right, you guys, just because I want to get this in, I think it's important for people to know. Just give me the name. I'm going to go around the horn. Heath, Adam, Dave first. The running back inside your top 20 that makes you the most nervous. Heath, go. Dalvin Cook. Adam? Le'Veon Bell. Le'Veon Bell. Dave? Todd Gurley. Okay, there you have it. A couple of veteran guys in terms of Bell and Gurley. And then you're looking at a situation with Dalvin Cook. A uh, little bit surprising. Uh, Heath, I want you to defend that one real quick. He's going to be a top five pick. We haven't seen him play a full season. And that Minnesota off defense might be bad this year. They may have to throw the ball a lot more. They may have to throw it to him a lot more, too, though. So that could certainly <laughs> help his, uh, his outlook. We'll see how things go for Dalvin Cook, though. So. Uh, it's been a fun show, guys. Way to break down the running back position. Also getting into what happened with Andy Dalton there. And uh, you can hear more about a lot of these topics on Fantasy Football Today. Download it wherever podcasts are found. For Dave, for Heath, for Adam, I'm Jamie. Thank you for watching Fantasy Football Today. Want more of the Fantasy Football Today podcast and nonstop year-round fantasy advice? It's simple. Hit the subscribe button and hang with us all throughout the year.